Welcome to CMA TV. We're here in Stanford at CMA Shipping, the largest trade show in shipping in North America. Um, my name's Roxy and I'm joined today by Kevin Coate, the Marine Technical Sales Manager for InnoSpec Fuel Specialties. Thank you for joining us, Kevin. Thank you for having us today, Roxy. And um, I was wondering, so what is the future for IMO 2020 fuels? Um, and do you see any issues, problems, or even opportunities with this? Well, that's a, that's a great question because it seems like everybody has an opinion these days on where the future's gonna be with what fuels are gonna be available and where in the various ports. And we see some compatibility and stability issues forthcoming, similar to what happened on the on-road land-based several years ago when they brought the sulfur regulations down. We started to see a lot of compatibility, stability issues, and sludge, uh, sludging in the tanks on board ships. So with that said, there's a big speculation on exactly what those fuels are gonna look like. We've had some samples we've recently obtained from a uh, shipping company and we're looking at various blends. Some of those are distillate based, more of a distillate based, others are more of a residual based. So you can look at these samples and see some are very light, like a, a diesel oil, mm -hmm. and some are very dark, like a heavy oil. So moving forward, everyone's expecting that there will be some issues going on, hence why people are looking at possibly using chemicals or additives moving forward to treat those. Okay, and um, so what do you see as the potential fuel quality concerns with these new fuels? And um, are there any uncertainties with what the fuels are going to be looking like? Well, as I just mentioned, we, we expect compatibility and stability issues moving forward. Again, when you look at a refinery level, they're going to move most of their streams where the higher margin products are going to be. So those are going to be with the distillates and there'll be less uh, residual fuels probably moving into the marine market only for those customers that have abatement technology installed, which are called scrubbers. So many of your smaller ports, which we'll get to a little bit later, may not be able to carry the multiple brands or the availability of different types of fuels that they have now. So the ship owners are gonna to have to look a lot more uh, hard at their bunker procedures on what they're gonna lift, where they're gonna lift. Now we've seen some issues with uh, compatibility right now. That's why many of the uh, major oil companies are coming up with their own blends and doing their own in-house testing to see which streams coming out of the refinery will be compatible with one another. A couple of the big companies have mentioned that all their streams out of, re uh, out of a refinery will be compatible, but I don't think you can say that with 100% certainty because many of the streams are a function of the crude slate that's being used and the refining process. You have hydro treating, you have bisque breaking, you have hydro cracking going on. So the more that these fuels are processed, the more the potential they'll have to be unstable because some of those uh, molecular structure of the asphaltine molecules will be damaged and those have to be restabilized with additives uh, in the field, either through the blenders or on board the ship. So moving forward, we expect to see issues, some uncertainty for the next two to three years as the market settles out, as additional people install scrubbers. So maybe the demand for high sulfur fuel will go up a little bit. And there's again, uncertainty around the price spreads between the fuels on whether those are going to open up more or whether, whether that will be uh, similar to what it is around $200 a metric ton. Okay, um, and so what do you think the ISO 8217 standard and testing, um, are those still relevant? Well, in and a nutshell, 8217, which is the fuel spec, mm -hmm. it's still relevant. Mm -hmm. But again, there's a lot of uncertainty. Has the spec kept up with the fuels that have been coming to market? No. So at the, uh, the IMO has, has uh, requested that ISO reevaluate that specification mm -hmm. and come up with what they call a compatibility matrix. So there's a working group within the ISO committee for 8217. And they're working on, they're looking at different crude slates and what the types of fuels will be out there, what type of blends they will be. Will it be more of a distillate based? As I mentioned, will it be more of a residual based? And they're working uh, on various compatibility tests. Right now, there's a new test out, relatively new, called Turboscan. It looks at what they call reserve stability number. And uh, if it's a number's below five, then it's a green light. If it's between five and 10, it's a yellow light. If it's above 10, it's a red light. It gives you an indication on how stable that fuel is to form sludge 
or for those asphaltene molecules to fall out of solution. So with that said, they're looking at, there's a couple other stability tests that various people use as a re, at a refinery level, at a blending level, a P test, an S test. Uh, they're looking at TSP, which is total sediment potential. And there's also a one they're looking at, it, it's called a, uh, a hot filtration test. Because on board, they do more of a uh, visual test on board a ship. So they're trying to come up with what are maybe two stability tests to incorporate moving forward that everybody will use instead of the refiners using one test, guys on the ship using another test, the blenders using a third test. Mm -hmm. And they're coming up with some new procedures and they're hoping to come up with a compatibility matrix by 2022 where people can look, okay, based upon where I'm getting my, uh, my fuel from, if it's more of uh, this base, say 80% distillate, and I'm trying to blend it with uh, another product that I'm lifting somewhere else in the world, it will either be a green light, a yellow light, or a red light. So that's ongoing at the ISO level and within a working group at the recommendation of the IMO. Um, that sounds very interesting. Um, could you give us a brief overview of what InnoSpec Fuel Specialties does? Well, InnoSpec has been around for several decades now. It's been a formation of several chemical companies that have merged off and on over the years. And they renamed themselves after a merger in, I think, in early 2000 uh, between Starion and Octal Chemical and renamed the company uh, InnoSpec Fuel Specialties. We are in various facets. We have about 1,900 employees around 23 countries. We are the fuel experts. We kind of know what we're talking about when it comes to this. We cover what's called from uh, well to wheels. So in other words, we have people that call on the drilling companies, the refineries, the pipelines, the terminal operators, and then all the way to the end users. So we actually have our additives within the passenger car market, within the aviation industry, within the power industry. I happen to be responsible for the marine industry in the Americas. So we've been around uh, in a spec itself, uh, renamed since 2004, and uh, we're, we're plugged in at various organizations at the IMO level, the ISO, CMAC, mm -hmm. ASTM, SAE, ASTM. So we have an un unparalleled research and technology group behind me supporting us for the marine. And then we manufacture all our marine products in Europe between Elmsmere Port UK, Hernay Germany, and Vernon, France. And then we bring everything into the Americas, into Houston, and distribute it out from there. But we are a, a mid-sized company publicly traded on NASDAQ with a global reach. And um, what do you think the global outlook is going to look like for 2020 fuels and also the availability of this fuel? That's a great question. I know some of the major oil uh, majors like uh, BP, Shell, Exxon Mobil have come out and said they now, some of them have said they have compliant, IMO 2020 compliant 0.5% fuel. Uh, again, in specific ports such as a Rotterdam, an Antwerp, a Singapore, a Fujairah, but globally, for those customers that are trading uh, not on a regular route, like some of the large container ship companies, they're going to have to really look at managing their bunker supplies. What are they going to lift and where are they going to lift? Because not all suppliers are created equal, as we know. Not all blends out there are going to be compatible with one another, or some are going to be more stable than others. In your major ports, you won't have an issue getting a compliant fuel or an MDO. Uh, or a MGO, the 0.1% uh, sulfur. But those that are buying in outlying ports, such as in Africa or parts of uh, Asia, outside of the Hong Kongs and the Singapores and the Shanghais, you're really gonna have potential issues on what's available where. You may not be, these smaller ports will not be able to carry the multiple brands and the multiple grades that they presently do mm -hmm. starting January 1st. So they may only be able to carry one compliant fuel and an MDO or an MGO, and that's it. So you're really going to have to do some due diligence moving forward. And in light of that, what do you think ship owners are going to have to do? 2020 is almost upon us. Um, how can they prepare and what do you think they need to look out for? Probably the most important question. It's mm -hmm. all about preparation. Put your due diligence in. Mm -hmm. The IMO has recommended that vessel owners work on an SIP, a ship implementation plan moving forward, which has several sections to it. You want to look at how you're going to segregate your tanks. Mm -hmm. How are you going to bunker? How are you going to treat your 
your bunkers on board with mm -hmm. additives? How are you going to operate your purifiers and separators? Uh, what type of testing methods are you going to use moving forward? There's some additional testing procedures that need to go in place, such as the TurboScan, looking at reserve stability number. If you're burning MGO, as the sulfur content has been coming down and down over the years, mm -hmm. you want to look at lubricity now. You may want to start testing for lubricity on your distillates to make sure that you're not having any premature pump failures and injector clogging. So that's one part of it. Again, the most important thing I can tell people is three things. Know your suppliers, deal with reputable companies, and develop a risk mitigation strategy, whatever that looks for you as a company. Some people are using additives on a regular basis to mitigate sludge, improve stability, and increase the chances of compatibility between different bunker stems. Mm -hmm. Other people are carrying products on board in case they do lift from an off port where they have a concern where the test comes back with a stability issue, they can additize the product on board and other people are using it for tank cleaning. Here's another whole uh, option that has opened up. Those tanks that are presently carrying the high sulfur fuel oil need to be prepared to receive the compliant fuel so that if they do get tested by flag state or port state and they, don't, they come up with a higher than a 0.5 level, they can get fines. That's a whole nother issue is enforcement. So tank cleaning is, is critical. I'll be doing a couple presentations on Wednesday and Thursday to talk about the use of additives as a tank cleaning option for at least the 50 to 75% savings versus going in and manually cleaning tanks. So that's probably the most important thing is to look at your tank cleaning procedures and prepare those tanks for those vessels that are not getting scrubbers installed to be able to receive a compliant fuel sometime in fourth quarter because you'll want to burn through at least one load of fuel, compliant fuel, in that tank prior to January 1st so that any remaining sulfur or sediment that's in the bottom of the tank will be removed and, and mitigated moving forward. So it's a combination of the SIP, which I highly recommend people work on because if you do your due diligence, and you do happen to get tested after January 1st and there's a slight violation, I think the enforcement authorities will look at you in a better light if you have all your documentation in place showing that you tried to do your due diligence to prepare for IMO 2020. I think the first three to six months, they'll be a little bit more lenient, but if you have the proper documentation and finally crew training, probably the most important thing and looking at your standard operating procedures on board as we just mentioned. So moving forward, it's all about preparation. That sounds like very interesting advice. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Roxy, appreciate it. Um, thank you for watching CMA TV.